Excellent session. Really appreciate the opportunity to be able to have Renetta here with us. Uh, so let me just kind of go through some of the initial slides here just to kind of remind people that hosted by the Center for Nonprofits and Philanthropy. Um, we've been here for a couple of years now and um, really appreciate this opportunity to be able to connect with you uh, online here. Um, you know, we have a whole portfolio of programs, but what I think I want to just emphasize again are our values that have been increasingly important, as I've mentioned before, for some of you who've been to these uh, programs, we talk about them each time. It's been an anchor for us. It helps us think about what we're trying to do, helps us prioritize our programs, which, you know, we believe in nonprofit organizations is, is sort of fundamental to who we are. Um, and, uh, and in particular, uh, seek to sort of support the work that enhances uh, opportunities for all um, and, and believe in the idea of engagement that uh, folks in our community should be able to become engaged and support and connected with the work that's going on. A lot of that happens through our nonprofit organizations, happens through uh, effective leadership and, and capable governance. And that was sort of where I got a chance to meet Vernetta is uh, we had, uh, uh, connected at, at, from her work at, at Board Source um, and many a years ago. So I was all a, a, a affiliate, affiliated with Board Source probably I don't know, 10 years, 15 years even, I think at this point that I've been working on and off of Board Source in some capacity or another, helping with some of their research. And Bernetta has been there and, and we've connected through some of our research activities and some of that. So let me just do a quick uh, little intro uh, and, and then turn it over because you don't need to hear any more from me. Uh, Bernetta Walker is president and CEO of Walker and Associates Consulting. Um, she best known, it says, as a governance gladiator um, with over 10 dec two decades of experience um, as a nonprofit leader, consultant Vernetta is passionate about helping organizations maximize their impact through exceptional leadership and in intellectual engagement and cultural competence. In addition to providing uh, consulting training, she is a frequent speaker on nonprofit lead, uh, leading practices, se sector trends, creating a culture of inclusion, board advocacy, Bernetta is also a senior governance consultant and senior advisor on diversity, inclusion, and equity at Board Source. Bernetta has worked with hundreds of public charities, associations, and foundations across the country and globally. The clients have included the Smithsonian National Museum and the American Indian, uh, Na National Museum of American Indian, YMCA, the National Aquarium, Corporation for Public Broadcasting, and, and the list certainly goes on and on and on. Prior to founding Walker and Associates, Fernando was served as Chief Governance Officer and Vice President of Programs at Board Source, Associate General at Council and Director of Consulting for the Maryland Association of Nonprofits, Foundation Advocacy Council for the Alliance for Justice, and Director of the Administration of Justice Grants for the Florida Bar Association. He's also practiced law for several years in Orlando, Florida. Adjunct lecturer for Columbia University, nonprofit management program, faculty member with Neighborhood Works, and a certified cultural transformation consultant with the Barrett Value Center. She's a member of the founding board of the Young Black, um, Young Black and Giving Back, serving on the board of March for Our Lives Action Fund and is chair of the March for Our Lives Foundation. She's also author of the forthcoming Diversity, Inclusion, and Ex Equity Action Guide for Nonprofit Executives and Board board members, a board source publication. Bernetta received her Juris Doctorate from the Washington University School of Law, St. Louis, Missouri, and a Bachelor of Arts degree from the University of Maryland. Bernetta, I appreciate it a lot that you're able to be here with us and share some of your perspectives today and uh, look forward to hearing your session. So let me get out of the way and uh, stop what I'm sharing and let you put yours up. I know there'll be just a minute of transition here. Thank you so much. I had no idea you were going to read the whole bio. Ah, I wanted everybody to hear it all. <laughs> no, I would have sent you just a, a little clip. Anyway, good, after, good afternoon, everyone. It's always, it's like super embarrassing. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> just having to wait through that part. Um, but let me say, I'm extremely excited to be here with you. And another reason I, I didn't know you were going to read is like, okay, you're eating into my time. I have so much to talk about today. <laughs> Whenever I'm asked to talk about um, issues related to diversity, equity, and inclusion, the first thing I usually ask is how much time do I have? 
Um, usually if it's an hour, I'm like, nope, can't do it, can't do it. But I said, Will, for you, I'll, I'll try. <laughs> so that's where we are. I'm going to share my screen. I have some slides. Um, I hope we have a little bit of fun today as well. This is a topic that I am deeply passionate about. And I'm so, I, I feel fortunate to be in this space right now doing work with organizations that are truly deepening their commitment. So here we go. Oops, how did I got to take you out? I forgot to do one thing. Stop. One more time. <laughs> Share. I have to click. Oh, there it is. I clicked the button. So I have a video and I needed to make sure that you would have audio. And that doesn't work unless I click the magic button. All right, I'm trying to go into presentation mode. I know it's always a little click. Uh, there we go. We got it. Looks great. Perfect. Perfect. All right. So today's topic, new nonprofit narratives for DEI. And I've got to tell you, there's a reason I selected that title. I always say I'm not creative when it comes to naming sessions. But one of the things I'm thinking about is that organizations are having different conversations these days. We've had a lot happen um, over the past 10 months. And that's feeding into it. So that's where we're going to start. All right, I've been introduced. Enough of that. <laughs> All right, get ready. I'm giving you a warning. What is my warning? <laughs> we're gonna have some frank language. <laughs> I say that's a warning because usually if we were in person, and even though the session title has something about diversity, equity, and inclusion, I sense the tenseness in everyone. They just kind of, oh, close up. And I have to do all kinds of work to create a safe environment, um, establish norms so that we can have, I'm going to say, air, hear my air quotes, courageous conversations. There's so much work involved just to get people to be able to talk about race, equity, even white dominant culture. So I'm letting you know we're, go we're going there. And I have a question for you and I would like you to use the chat box. It's a yes or no. Did your organization whether you're working with a nonprofit, on a board, volunteering, did your organization issue a public statement this year addressing race equity or talking about DEI? Seeing a couple of yeses. We are empowering, yes, 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 yes. Okay, you can keep it coming. I expected as much. <laughs> Um, certainly we experienced, I see, trying to see, I don't think I see a single no, and I don't know if everyone answered, but not a single no. And if you do say no, you're in a really, really, really small minority there because everyone, for profits, not for profits, they were clamoring to get their statements out the door. And it was readily apparent who had actually had some conversations internally, who had actually been doing some work and who was just trying to respond to pressure to say something about what we were all experiencing as a nation. Uh, as I started reading these statements, um, because there were, you couldn't miss them in your inbox. If you've ever flown, I think every airline I'd ever flown, their statement was in my inbox. Every hotel I'd ever stayed in, their statement was in my inbox. And then you have the companies, Ben and Jerry's, everyone. But there were some, and here's where the disappointment set in. Some of the statements from nonprofit organizations did not have much meat. They essentially said, we stand with you or, you know, we support Black Lives Matter. And I'm asking, and then what? <laughs> what what does that mean? Are you going to do something a little differently? Um, what about, and oh, and this was a real telling point. 
for some of the organizations that issued the statement and more than likely it was the CEO, they hadn't talked to the boards and they hadn't talked to the staff. And I saw a lot of feeds, whether Twitter, Instagram, you name it, about, wow, my company, my organization put out a statement. We've never even had a conversation about it. So I wanna make sure that we actually lean into this moment and start doing things differently because it's an opportunity that we have. Um, and what's different about this moment? Several things. Um, let's start with the pandemic. And while that started early in the year, we certainly had um, data, and I should say we also had data very early on that the pandemic was impacting communities of color um, very differently, or I would say much um, to, a, to a greater extreme, if you're trying to advance. There we go. Just wanted to share a little bit of data. I'm not gonna go deep in this, but if you just look at this in terms of hospitalization, death rates and um, the cases, you're seeing five times higher hosp hospitalization or almost five times higher. Um, American Indian, Alaska Native, um, look at the Black or African American, and these numbers I pulled in August. So CDC is definitely keeping track on that, and we're, we're just seeing how this plays out. Then around the same time, and I started with the pandemic because the pandemic in and of itself created a different type of environment. Now, you know, some folks were quarantined at home. Um, a lot of people were working from home. And it seemed like we were experiencing things as a nation. We saw things. You were, I usually, prior to everything shutting down, I was traveling constantly. Now I'm working from home and I'm seeing things on the news like Amy Cooper and this guy who was just trying to watch some birds in Central Park. Um, and so the news really ran with this story that he simply asked her to put Alicia on her dog and she says, I'm calling the police on you. I'm calling the police. I'm going to tell them there's a black man here and I feel threatened. Those weren't her exact words, but that was the gist of it. So that played out and I put this up because that really caught my attention, but at the same time, there have been a number of other stories that have been shared, but maybe not as broadly. Uh, it's funny how when you see something and now that you're aware of it, you start paying attention to the other stories that, were, are, that are similar. So there was a whole list of news stories where Black people were being, were, um, people were calling the police on Black people just were doing everyday things, everyday things. And on that list, it also included, get this, golfing too slowly. Imagine this, a group of African-American women on a golf course, they called the police. They said they were, take, they were taking, they were being too slow. Um, waiting for friends at Starbucks. So that had happened a couple of years ago, or actually they, I believe they were waiting on a friend slash client, barbecuing at a park, um, so we've heard the term driving while black, you now barbecuing while black, uh, napping in a university common room, not waving as you leave an Airbnb, make someone call the police on you. So this really was part of it. Same month we saw on TV, Ahmaud Aubrey being attacked and then he was, and he was killed. He was jogging near his home. And this right here was the tipping point. This was the point where everyone essentially paused as a nation for a period of time. Eight minutes, 46 seconds. And I describe it as, as a nation, we experienced a collective gap. It was hard to watch. And I think it also made some say, enough is enough. We saw protests, and I'm gonna go with peaceful protests. I know there were some riots, but peaceful protests. 
Um, more recently, these statements were issued by American Medical Association, um, American Academy of Pediatrics, American College of Physicians, saying racism is a public health issue and police brutality must stop. Uh, now, they issue statements, and of course, they were not the only ones issuing statements. A lot of uh, organizations and entities were issuing statements. I just called those three out. And what I found really compelling about that is that we have data. The data isn't new. We've always had data that we have profound outcome gaps. And race is the most reliable predictor of outcomes across life expectancy, academic achievement, income, wealth, physical and mental health, and maternal mortality. Imagine that. It's not like we don't know it. We have lots of data on it. So time for change. What's different about this moment is that I think for the first time we're seeing that these aren't one-off situations. There's a pattern. There's a pattern that we hadn't paid attention to before. And also what's different about this time Organizations are for the first, I won't say for the first time, but I don't want to make blanket statements, but there is a higher level of curiosity about what do we need to do about this and how can we create change. But before we create change, um, I'm going to say deep structural changes, systemic change, etc. We still have to have some conversations. So I want to start with this one. This is Brian Stevenson, and this is about maybe four minutes long. And I just love his message here. I think it's very powerful. So let me play this. Hi, my name is Brian Stevenson, and I'm the founder and executive director of the Equal Justice Initiative in Montgomery, Alabama. I'm also the author of Just Mercy. This is a critical moment in our nation's history. There is a need for reckoning with our history of racial inequality and racial injustice that is dramatically on display in our streets. We are a nation that is not free. We have been corrupted, polluted by our long history of racial injustice. There are things we haven't talked about that we need to talk about. We are a post-genocide society. When Native people came to this continent, uh, we killed them by the millions through famine and war and disease, but we didn't call it genocide. We said those native people are savages and we used that rhetoric to create this ideology of white supremacy. It allowed us to enslave black people for two and a half centuries. And the great evil of American slavery wasn't the involuntary servitude, it wasn't the bondage, it was this fiction that black people aren't as good as white people, that black people are less deserving, less evolved, less capable. And that ideology of white supremacy survived the Civil War. I've often argued that slavery doesn't end in 1865, it just evolves. We were promised freedom and the right to vote, but what we received was terror and violence and lynching. For nearly a century, black people were pulled out of their homes. They were beaten, they were hanged, they were drowned. Uh, they were menaced and traumatized. That terrorism went uncorrected. It would be the police sometimes that would step away and allow the mobs to pull black people out of the jail and where they would, and then li literally lynch them on the courthouse lawn. In the 1950s and 60s, courageous black people challenged this legacy of Jim Crow and segregation, put on their Sunday best to protest nonviolently, and they would pray and they would fight and they would march and they'd be on their knees sometimes and still get battered and brutalized by police officers. The laws changed, but that narrative persisted. And even today, there is a presumption of dangerousness and guilt that gets assigned to black and brown people. And you can be an actor, you can be a musician, you can be a teacher, you can be a clergy member, you can be an engineer. It doesn't matter how hard you work or how much money you acquire, you will go places if you're black in this country and you'll have to navigate these presumptions of dangerousness and guilt. I've gotten old enough to tell you that it's exhausting. Things need to change. We need an era of truth and justice in America. 
We need to commit ourselves to being honest about our past, to reckoning with it. In South Africa, there was a period of truth and reconciliation. In Rwanda, in Germany, there has been truth and justice. In Germany, there are no Adolf Hitler statues. In this country, the American South is littered with the iconography of the Confederacy. Truth and justice is sequential. You can't have truth and reconciliation. You can't have truth and reparation. You can't have truth and restoration at the same time. These things are sequential. You have to tell the truth before you get to the restoration, before you get to the reconciliation. I'm excited because in this moment, we have an opportunity to do more, to do better. I believe there's something better waiting for us in America. I think there's something that feels more like freedom, feels more like equality, feels more like justice waiting for us. But to get there, we're going to have to commit to reckoning with our history, to telling the truth about our past, to engaging in important dialogue and conversations. I'm excited that you are having some of those conversations. You are part of this effort. I want to thank you for that and invite you all to come and see us in Montgomery, but more than that, to invite you to continue being part of this process to change America, to lift up truth and justice. I always just want to say thank you, Brian. <laughs> it's as though he's talking to us directly, and I think he is. And what I love, he said, we have an opportunity to do more and do better. And then the question is, will we, Hi. there we go. Will we squander this opportunity? I say no. All right. So how do we start? We start, we need to make sure we have some shared vocabulary and shared understanding. And there are only three things that I wanna point out today. One is race. I have a definition on the screen. I hear people say all the time, race is a social construct. And as they're saying it, I'm not sure they really know what that means. But if you read this, and this was um, a definition I grabbed from Wikipedia, every book, every resource that I have now, everyone has their definitions. But I said, um, this is straightforward. It's a grouping of people based on social quality into categories based on social qualities um, that are determined by society. And yeah, it's not an inherent physical or biological quality. And these categories and groupings um, were usually to provide a benefit to one group over another group. My next definition, equity, fair treatment, opportunity, advancement, um, eliminating barriers. And all of that would be your, uh, or I should say the bottom line there is that your race should not determine your outcomes. When I talk about equity in my work with organizations, I always place a particular emphasis on systems and structures. If, you, if we really want to pursue and advance equitable outcomes, then we have to look deeper at the barriers. And quite often there's a lot of intersectionality there. It's not just race. Some will think it's um, socioeconomic status. Well, let's just solve for this. And then you, what you start to see is that it's not just one thing. If a child, and I'm gonna say, um, maybe it's a, a young African-American boy in, in school who's not performing well. And you say, why is that? What does the school need more money? Or, but then what happens if you look at a community that is investing in their inner city schools and the kids still aren't performing? So then you have to consider, do they have food at home? What are the other barriers that they may be facing? There are connections, our systems are all linked together and by just perhaps trying to solve one little thing or provide one advantage, it means that the system will keep perpetuating disparate outcomes. So equity means we have to dig deeper, but to do that, we have to also have, be willing to have some tough conversations. Pop quiz for you right now. And Will is going to help me with this. Only two questions. Let's see if you get it. Let's start with 
question number one, you can launch the first. Oh, yeah, go ahead. We have our first poll launch. Pretty straightforward. There we go, let's see. Will, you want to give us some color, color commentary as no, the answers are coming, what's coming in? in. We're, getting, <laughs> we're getting our responses. I was going to wait and let a few more folks come in there. Uh, it's actually spread around. So uh, we'll wait another minute or two, I bet you, or another second or two here. Anybody else want to jump in there and give their, uh, provide a response to that? Okay, let's see if I can come over here and... Let's take a look. Here, I'll share it and I will share the results. Okay. You see that? I see it. I don't know if anyone else can. I think they, they can. can. Okay. All right. So, yeah, you're all over the place. Yeah. What did I say as I was defining back on that slide that defined race? It's a social construct, it's not real. And that means that the only answer that could be right is none. Yeah. Hey. They got it. <laughs> but we were all kind of over the place. So, yeah. So none. There are no characteristics, traits, not even one gene that distinguishes all members of one so-called race from all members of another so-called race. <laughs> all right. Thanks for participating. Now let's see how you do on number two. I'll second poll. It's out there. Okay, of the $20 billion in home loans underwritten by the federal government between 1933 and 1962, what percentage went to white homeowners? Owners, sorry about that. Well, this is a knowledgeable group. They seem to be, let's see how they're coming in here. Ryan for it. Hey, we have 30 of 30 who respond. There we go. All right. So you're leaning into this now, feeling more Ooh. comfortable. And the majority of you got that answer correct. It is 98%. Think about that. Let it settle in that this is what essentially established the middle class in America. This and the GI Bill, but people of color were excluded from the GI Bill as well, right? So, and from establishing the middle class, then you start to develop generational wealth and, or at least resources. I'm most necessary, I don't mean wealth as in very wealthy, but this is where it starts. Beginning in the 1930s and the 40s, the federal government created programs that subsidized low cost home loans, opening up home ownership for millions of Americans for the very first time. And at the same time, government underwriters introduced national appraisal systems tying property value and loan eligibility to race, invented, um, inventing redlining and effectively locking non-white out of home buying just as the middle class was taking hold. Hmm. There's so much history that we just need to go back and visit and share because this is something it's just not widely talked about. Everyone should know. Um, and these questions and this, uh, uh, there's so much. PBS did a documentary, I, want to say, I don't know how many years ago, but it was called The Power of an Illusion. And it talks about this and it talks about how race or these concepts kind of evolve. So just very interesting. But at the end, they say a couple of things everyone should know. It's a race is a modern concept, no genetic basis. Um, it justifies social inequalities as natural. And it's not biologi biological, but racism is still real. Okay, so just let that sink in for a little bit. I need to keep it moving. Bias. Uh, I wanted to make sure that we had an opportunity to talk about bias because now that I've put race on the table, I have to put bias on the table. 
because it explains so much in terms of how decisions are made, why even today across the nonprofit sector, we see boards are still predominantly white. Think about 84% white. We do pretty well in terms of the mix of gen the gender mix. Um, who's running major companies, et cetera. So let me talk about bias just briefly. Most of our biases are formed by the time we are seven years old. And our biases, and so where does that come from? Family, school, media, news, teachers, et cetera. It's baked in, it's unconscious, it's down below. If we use the iceberg metaphor, it's below the surface. And yet it's impacting so much of what we do on an everyday basis. And yes, it shows up in our nonprofit organizations. It shows up in the boardrooms. It's involuntary and bias. Let me say this. Biases can be positive or negative. We have biases um, for people who would be in what you might call your in-group. Your in-group, you might define that based on gender, race, ethnicity, et cetera. Um, and if you go way back, um, there are scientists who said that bias helped people or, and they went back to like cavemen and said, it helped people automatically identify who was not in their tribe. So it might trigger the fight or, fl uh, or flight um, reaction. But how it shows up today, um, quite different. And yet people will say, I'm not biased, but we're all susceptible to it. And so we have these reactions when our behaviors um, are inconsistent with who we believe we are. Take, for example, if I go back to the Amy Cooper situation, after the news broke and um, someone was interviewing her, do you recall the first thing she said? She said, I'm not racist. I'm not racist because that's not who she believes she is. And that's why I'm not saying that she is, but somewhere the seeds had already been planted. I wanna do this exercise with you. It's just, and you may have seen it before, called exercise of the unconscious. I have a photo, a picture of two tables. And I have one question. Are the tables the same size? You can chat your response. I'm looking for yeses, noes, and I mean the exact same size. Don't say, well, if I measure it or we, you know, get figure out the circumference. No, the exact same size. What would you say? What do you say? And I'm looking at my chat box. Like, don't be afraid to answer. Someone said no, yes, no, no, no. Okay. Most of you are saying no. Watch this. All right. You can see, same picture. I took a piece of vellum paper, put it over the photo, and I simply traced one picture, one table because I had to figure out how do I do this on a PowerPoint virtually. <laughs> so this was my best attempt. I traced it and then I simply turned the vellum to place it over the other table, exact same size. And I don't know whether they're rectangular or square. <laughs> <laughs> I just don't know. But this exercise shows that we're not always totally in control. And they explain this as a cognitive illusion because your brain automatically converts the image into a 3D interpretation as they must be in the natural world, whatever that means. Um, it's not, yeah, it's not an optical illusion. And I had to stop and think, if my brain is doing this, and here's the, the piece that gets me. They say, once you are aware of this, the next time you see the picture, you'll see it. 
it's different. I still don't see it. <laughs> I still think they're different sizes. My, I know that they're different, but my eyes ha cannot make that adjustment. And so it just opens the door that, yeah, a little bit of doubt. Maybe there are things going on at a level that we're not fully aware of. And wouldn't it be helpful to really take some time and discover where we may have biases that are impacting how we operate, how we view others, the decisions that we make, all of this. We make a lot of assumptions about people and that's what a lot of this is about. On this, um, talking about biases, let me just share, because I don't wanna be so vague, I wanna share a couple of examples about how biases really show up. Um, Trying to see that. Uh, let me get off the table. If you think about it, you and you've probably heard some of these stories. When organizations really wanted to be more proactive and try to mitigate for bias, they tried a lot of different experiments. And there are a couple that come to mind for me. I think of symphony orchestras, where at one point they were predominantly male. And of course, someone is asking, well, wait, there are really good qualified female musicians. So what did they do? For the auditions, they actually put up a screen, a curtain, where you could not see who was auditioning. I also um, had to check and verify. They said they also put down carpet so you could not hear high heels walking across the stage. And as a result of that little change, having the blind auditions, the percentage of women in symphony orchestras increased considerably. I'm hearing feedback, I'm not sure where it's coming from. Another um, experiment or test, and this one was a controlled test. And there, there are a couple of different versions of these. You've probably heard of the resume test where they will send out resumes with white sounding names and black sounding names to see who gets um, invited for an interview or a callback. As I read through some of the resume tests, the one there were two that really stood out for me. There was one where they sent out essentially four sets of resumes. Um, and the four sets were one group was highly qualified individuals with white sounding names. Um, not really qualified individuals with white sounding names. And the same thing with black sounding names, highly qualified, not so qualified. In that instance, the white sounding names definitely received 50% more callbacks. And the white sounding names who were not qualified received more callbacks than black sounding names that were highly qualified. There was one other resume test where they also included a criminal conviction. White sounding names with a criminal conviction received twice as many callbacks, callbacks as white sound as black sounding names, no conviction with all the qualifications. Can someone explain this? So let me pause and see if we have questions because whoo, I went on a street for a while for a minute. I know some, I don't see any questions in our chat box. I believe it's called Race, the Power of an Illusion. Yes, that was the PBS documentary. Thank you. We're small enough as an audience, if you'd like to unmute and pose a question, it works. If yeah, not, okay. Reflections, anybody wanna? Chime in. Bernetta, I yeah. have, and I'd like your view on this. Since we have years of science um, on these phenomena, what are the barriers that companies um, seem to face that they're not making changes? that would make a difference in this space? What, what, what's going on there? Oh my gosh. <laughs> First of all, 
Great question. And I also want to acknowledge how big that question is. And of course, it's going to be different from from company to company. I'll tell you some of the things that I have seen. And there's some consistency with this. Yes, we have the data. Um, I would say the data is, has by and large been ignored, plain and simple. We have, okay, let me get to the term white dominant culture. We operate in such a way that we think everything is a meritocracy, that we can be perfectly objective and people will get what they deserve and we're fair. We have biases, I've just talked about that. So this, the, even the notion that we're not fair, our processes are you know, fair for everyone, there, there's disbelief there. There's also the fact that what we're asking them to do is not a technical fix, but an adaptive change. We're pushing against status quo and years and years and uh, you know, decades of history in terms of how things have been done. We cannot discount the fact that the systems as they are now benefit certain people and those individuals feel as though it's a zero sum game. Either I have to give up what I have or, you know, anyway, well, zero sum. Don't want to give up what I have, but they're not seeing that we all benefit from ensuring that opportunities and access widely available. But that is a huge shift to make. So much so I even think about the executive order that was issued a couple of weeks ago saying or prohibiting um, government entities or using government funds for any type of training or workshop on unconscious bias um, and the whole framing of it. And I've got to say this, when someone sent that to me initially, I thought, is this a joke? Like, I really thought someone was, it was a prank. <laughs> so I had to go on the internet and say, oh my gosh, this is real. Like, you can't talk about this. Um, so there are those who feel that they have a lot to lose. And there's the fact that doing the work is hard because it has to be done at a number of different levels. The personal level, for some, they have to unlearn some things that they learned and learn some new things all about the data and the science. Um, the organizational level, the leadership level as well. So when we're creating change, we have to really pull a lot of different um, levers to get where we're gonna go, but also in creating the change and where I have seen the most reluctance previously is that when organizations, I'm gonna say nonprofit organizations, they'll say, okay, maybe there's a recognition that we need to diversify our board. Our board is predominantly white. We're serving maybe a predominantly a community of color. And they say, shouldn't we reflect the community a little bit, right? So they'll start there. That's, that's a, what I would call a baby step. Um, but even with that, they would struggle. It's like, okay, we're gonna have one conversation about this and then they go back to old patterns of, well, who do you know? Who do you know? And you get the same thing. Here's what's different. Organizations now, and that's why I went through everything that happened, well, not everything, but some of the things that happened this summer, it cracked the door open a little bit more. I'm seeing leaders taking a step back saying, you know what, if we're actually gonna make some traction, now is the time and now is the time to do the work differently. So instead of seeing DEI as a one-off, maybe we're gonna have one workshop, they're saying, we're gonna commit. And I wanna talk about what that looks like. Cause you said, we have all of the knowledge, the research, the data, but the real commitment requires leadership, got to have some champions, and they have to know that they're in it for the long haul. It's not going to happen over, overnight. So there are a couple of things I want to talk about with my last 15 minutes. Uh, this is what I was trying to say. Yeah, When the country fails to include a large number and re restrict it, we're weakened as a whole. 
that's an attitude shift. It's not just, you know, we got the 1% that they're happy. Um, but what about all of America? We have great opportunities at hand. And I like this quote from, I'm sorry, that should say Dr. Ross, not Rose, R-O-S-S, -S, um, California Endowment. And they've done an incredible um, job and a lot of work around equity. So as we concluded that we needed to ratchet the, ratchet the seriousness, needed to ratchet the seriousness of our resolve, the question that arose, are we as a foundation committed enough to this issue to track and measure improvement? It's not a one-off and they definitely made the commitment. This is what I was talking about in terms of work at every level. So, and I don't ha even have the personal level on here, but that has to be part of the journey. The board setting the tone at the top. What does that look like? It requires a willingness to examine processes, procedures, culture, eliminate bias, um, and then figure out how can you be inclusive? So if I think about boards, um, and let me give you this one con a concrete example. It was before everything that happened this year, thank goodness, because we got to do so much work. I think we started in 2018. I was working with a national association. They are huge, huge membership base, and they also have international um, affiliates or chapters. They said, we want to do things differently. It's the organization was over 100 years old, and in their 100 years, they had never had a person of color lead as a the president or president. And the current board president felt like, okay, I want this to happen on my watch. So we had great, they had great buy-in from the CEO and the board president. And in starting, we had to start with, I, and I started with a conversation with the board because I thought it was great that the president was all in, but I know, knew that we needed to build some alignment and they needed to understand why it matters for them beyond just having diversity on the board. And let me just say that this, this is an organization, um, I can talk about them, they have my name on their website, <laughs> Infectious Disease Society of America. So that, that's why I say, good thing we got our work, a lot of work done because they're really, really busy right now. Um, we started with a board conversation and I started in terms of talking about bias. How is it that in 100 years, and I saw all of those photos of the past presidents, they were white men and maybe five women, 100 years. And this is a group that I don't have to define bias for them. They learn about it in medical school and graduate school, et cetera. But the different conversation was, how is it showing up here? And being able to um, dive deeper on that and then answering the question, okay, if this is really a priority, what must you do differently as a result of this? So of course, now you notice I talk about processes, procedures, et cetera. Everyone looks at their bylaws. Well, the membership elects, okay. Bylaws can be amended. What do you wanna do? And one by one, we started talking about what needs to happen. Even looking at an association, who's selecting the presenters at your conference where you have like 20,000 people attending? Who's selecting, um, oh, all kinds of things. Uh, the, the chairs for the journals, et cetera. Who gets to publish, et cetera. So when you start looking at processes, and who's in place and how those individuals get selected, then you, get, you have some decisions to make. Let me keep this moving. They wanted a roadmap for, well, you know, because when we started, it was truly, there was zero roadmap. It was like, they knew they wanted to change top to bottom and it wasn't just about who was on the board. They wanted to change as an organization. So we started in terms of what type of statement do you want to make publicly about who you are as an organization and how can, what does that look like to actually put it in writing? What's the impact that you wanna have? 
And in those discussions, as we started digging deeper, they went beyond their membership to how do we influence um, the medical schools and the curricula and the hospitals and the private practitioners, et cetera. So they know that, you know, this wasn't work that was just for one year. There are short-term objectives, long-term objectives. We use data um, and they're continuing to collect data so that they can see where they are making progress. And they made some decisions around what they wanted to lift up and measure and also share publicly. Education, making resources available, not just for the board, but also for the staff and more broadly. And I worked with a task force that identified and put on the private part of their website a number of, of resources that they felt would be really helpful for their members to understand disparities in health, bias, um, social determinants of health, et cetera. A lot of what you get when you're studying this, but also in clips, and I made sure I said, everything doesn't have to be a full on academic article. Let's include some TED talk, talks, because there's some good ones out there, short clips, articles, podcasts, et cetera. And then implementing. So with the larger vision laid out, strategies laid out, they could also have staff working with board where appropriate in terms of implementation, but something else that they put on their list and strategy was to hire a chief equity officer. And I know that was in the works for this year. And then knowing that you have to continue to evaluate and measure and track your progress and adjust. So this um, little, di I don't know what to call this diagram, this thing <laughs> that I, I put on the screen, I use it to help organizations understand that there's a process. This isn't the only process, but these steps are definitely common for organizations that are doing this work, just like if you were gonna do strategic planning, there are steps you have to take. You can't just jump to the end. And there are organizations that wanna jump straight to the end. I'll give you an example. I had a phone call from someone, she was doing due diligence on behalf of the board. And she said, oh, board is, you know, they've been having great conversations, like they're ready, they, they just need um, tactics. You know, like, do you have a toolkit? And I said, and then what? Because actually great conversations, they had had about two conversations. They just felt like they needed to, they just needed tactics. And when I said, and then what? The woman who was on the other end, she was like, gosh, you are the sixth person who has said that to me. <laughs> Think about it. They want to jump straight to the end. Doing the work means that you are committed to a transformative change for your organization. You want something that will be sustainable, even as board members term off, um, as employees come and go, you start to bake things in to your systems, your processes, your practices, your culture, and you're also setting those expectations on the front end as people are coming into the organization. I always say beware of resistance because it will show up for those who commit to the work and it shows up in a lot of different ways. Um, these are just some examples when you start and I've heard all of these in organizations that I work with. So I wanna say, is this really our mission? You know. This isn't really about us. And yeah, it's everybody's mission. It's, it's in there somewhere in the work that you do. Um, we'll turn people off. Yeah, and then that gets connected to, you know, our funders, we're gonna lose some of our donors or we're gonna lose some of our funders. And here's the good thing that I'm seeing when we're doing the work at this level. It's the board members who will recognize we can take that risk because now we understand what we're doing. And if we lose a few, that might happen, but we're also gonna gain some new, some new donors, some new supporters. So that's the importance of, again, I'd say a new narrative, having the conversation, going deeper on the conversations, you actually know what it is that you're supporting and why. Not everything that is faced can be changed, but nothing can be changed until it is faced. James Baldwin, 
love that quote. I will stop sharing so I can see all of you. I think I stopped, I'm not sure, I think I did. I don't know, I lost you. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> um, I was thinking, go ahead. There was a question online. I mean, Eric posted it a little bit ago, so maybe I'll uh, go on ahead and. Uh, but he's talking about uh, efforts to, to about when you were making the reference around the resume. So it's about tactics, right? And they were doing some redacting to try and remove both gender and racial identifiers on some of the resumes. And his his question was, we're getting a little bit of pushback maybe from the hiring managers. Um, and other thoughts about reducing bias in the hiring process. So yeah, it's a tactic. <laughs> um, I want to know what the pushback is. And actually, I'm working with an organization, and that's something that we're anticipating. Um, and one of the things that I've talked about, and in this organization, they can't completely create like the blind resume, there are going to be some identifying factors, and they know that. Um, one of the things that we've talked about is how are we setting expectations with those who will be involved in the interviewing process and hiring, and um, more broadly within HR, because this is, an, this is an organization where it's the, you know, across the full organization, not just the board and not, um, yeah, not just representation. So within the HR process uh, or HR realm, we're looking at how do we create an environment that is, I'm going to say, not punitive, but clearly sets an expectation that this is who you are as an organization. You're creating an organization where everyone can really be their authentic selves and fully contribute to the organization. And in doing that, and looking at um, how you've operated previously in terms of the interview process, are we automatically excluding some? So in this case, when I said they couldn't totally blind it, but uh, especially because they collect certain documents, there are people who would say, well, if they're not Ivy League, I'm not even gonna talk to them. Okay, so how many people have you already excluded? And so I'm talking about getting that granular in terms of figuring out what type of pushback are we talking about and how do we solve for that? So I don't know the specifics of that situation, but that's an example where someone is saying, well, you know, no, we can't do it. Yes, you can. But they probably never even thought previously about how their processes were automatically excluding a lot of people. Great question. I love the questions. We got one more minute. Yep. <laughs> okay. Well, I hope this was helpful and I would pose the question to you. Now that you have some ideas, what will you do differently? How are you going to change the narrative? Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, Vernetta, for bringing that up. A lot of good stuff. I love the diagram. Several people asked about the PowerPoint, so we'll, uh, we'll get a copy of those and make sure that they're available on the website so people have them, because that, that, that uh, diagram or the roadmap in some ways is, is, is quite useful and a good reminder. You can imagine unpacking that, the set of strategies and tactics, right? Because it is a tricky process. We both worked quite a bit on helping boards think a little bit about how you can improve the diversity of your board. And we've been working on a long time and seen modest and modest nudging, modest movement there, but it, 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 commitment and, and, and the process that you just talked through is key. So I appreciate you coming and sharing a little bit of your thoughts and all the good work that you're doing out there. Thank you.